I've noticed through the years that people around Thanksgiving, especially on social media like Facebook or Twitter or something, they'll start at this time of year saying what I'm thankful for. My sister lo loves it. Every, every day, I'm thankful for. She'll put something on her Facebook post. I'm Thanksgiving. Well, you know, once you start doing that, at the beginning you have these grand lofty designs, but by the end of it, it becomes almost trivial banality. Uh, people start by saying, I'm thankful, for, uh, I'm thankful for my husband. He's such a wonderful person. I'm thankful for my God, He's, and, and I'm thankful for my church. You get to the middle of it. I'm thankful for this wonderful pair of shoes. You get down to the end. I'm thankful for the belt that's holding my pants up. I'm thankful for gummy worms. But those kind of, the, the, the thought is, at Thanksgiving, we count our blessings. And it's something we do as a national holiday. We count our blessings. And we have the blessings that, and we think about the fact that, that people came here and people died here so long ago and people carved out this country. And that's part of what we think about when we think about Thanksgiving. Count your blessings, right? Count your blessings. Typically on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving night at Robot Parkway, we will do a Thanksgiving service, a nice service, and we'll talk about uh, blessings that people get in life. We talk about the blessings we have. Some, uh, there'll be one guy, he'll talk about blessings of the family. There'll be another guy who'll talk about our material blessings and the blessings we have just from being part of this life. Another gentleman will talk about this year our church blessings and the blessings we have from being part of the church. This year, I get to talk about the spiritual blessings we have. I get to talk about the fact that we have spiritual blessings in this life. And this has led me, and while I considered this and I tried to think about this, and in the interest of killing two birds with one stone, that's where this sermon comes from. And when I started thinking about spiritual blessings, it led me to Ephesians 1.3. And if you flipped over to Ephesians 1.3... It says there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. You know, I know, I, I think I said last time, that it seems like all the sermons are ending with, In Christ. In Christ. And you know, it's not necessarily because of me. I think in Christ is a cornerstone of Paul's theology. 136 times Paul uses the terms in Christ are some equivalent as he writes his letters. And you, go, you get down to Ephesians and it, it's almost 36 times of those 100, 136 times Paul uses it. In Ephesians. Just Ephesians. Over and over again, the cornerstone of, of Paul's Christian theology is in Christ. What we have in Christ. And typically, we equate that with you don't get salvation out of Christ. But if you look here in Ephesians and you start reading at verse 3 and you go through verse 14, you actually see some of the blessings we have because we are in Christ. And these are spiritual blessings. You can't get them outside of Christ. Only in Christ. So the question became to me, what spiritual blessings do I have in Christ? Because he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. And when I think about that, I say, what are these spiritual blessings? And these spiritual blessings are all found right here. When you first started, you looked... In Ephesians 1.4, it says there, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, so let me clarify, there's a lot of pronouns there going on. It says, Just as he chose us, that's God, chose us in him, that's Christ, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's God. He chose us. We are chosen in Christ. That should give you a wonderful feeling. God opted for us. God opted for mankind. God opted for us. God opted for you. Better than that, God opted 
for me. Me. He sat down at one point and said, these people, I want them. I want them. And Paul says, God wants us through Christ. It is in Christ that this happens. In Christ. If you go into 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul is talking to Timothy there, and he says in reference to God, God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. It's the same thing he says to the Ephesians. In, in, in the Ephesians, he says he chose us in him. To Timothy, he says, for his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. He says both of those things. The, the grace that he gives us, the opting for us, was given to us in Christ Jesus. And both times he says it was before time began. We often talk about the omniscience of God. And God was able to look down the corridors of time and know that we would sin. Made us knowing we would sin, eventually fall. He made the way back. He made the way back in Jesus Christ. That's where that blessing comes from. That's where chosen It's in Jesus Christ. You don't get chosen outside of Jesus Christ. You don't get chosen and put in Jesus Christ. You get in Jesus Christ and that's where you're chosen to be. These things go together. And as you think about that, not only were we chosen, but we have been adopted because of that choosing. In Jesus Christ. You drop down to Ephesians 1.5. It says there, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God marked out where Christianity was. God marked out ahead of time where it was. And we have to put ourselves in that. And when we get in that, we are cho that that's where the cho chosen comes from. But when we put ourselves in where God has marked out, He says we've been adopted by Jesus Christ. He says they're adopted as sons by Jesus Christ. The adoption doesn't come because we want it. The adoption doesn't come because I'm just strolling down the street one day and it's happened to me. The adoption doesn't come because God said, Scott Crawford, you're adopted. The adoption comes by Jesus Christ. The adoption is through something. Through Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus is talking to his disciples in Luke 12, 32, and he says there, Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Your Father's good pleasure. You know, over and over and again, the idea of God our Father shows up. God our Father. God our Father. If you go to almost every epistle that Paul wrote at the beginning, save for perhaps Galatians, he talks, he says the words, God our Father. God our Father. God our Father comes up over and over again. One of the best beloved parables. A song is written after it in, in many song books. It's the parable of the prodigal son. Where we get a glimpse of God being the Father waiting for someone to come to their senses and to come home. Come back. God our Father. In that idea, we become we we, we get an in, we get a vision, a metaphorical understanding of how we relate to God as being our Father. In Romans eight fourteen and fifteen, it says there: For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. He says the same thing in Galatians. Abba, Father. We receive that spirit. Abba, Father. And why can we do that? Because we are the children of God. God made us. 
You go all the way back to Genesis and we find out that God breathed life into the nostrils of man. You go to Malachi and you look at Malachi 2.10 right at the beginning of the verse it says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Created us. We are all one children and God wants us to come back. That's that adoption. Once we get into where the, the Christ is, we have become adopted. That's a spiritual blessing to be chosen, to be adopted. Also, we have God's grace where? In the beloved. Keep looking at Ephesians. Ephesians 1.6 To the praise and glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. Now, who's the beloved? Oh, it's, I mean, when you go to the Song of Solomon, you got the beloved and the Shulamite. Not the same beloved. I have seen some people say, well, you know, it's a vision of Christ in the church. But the beloved here is Christ. The beloved he's talking about in Ephesians is Christ. And we know that because we can go to Titus. In Titus 2.11 it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Jesus is that grace. Jesus is that grace that's appeared to all men. Turn over in Ephesians to Ephesians 4, 7, 4, uh, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. And there it says, By God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Oh, in Christ Jesus, over and over again. It's that kindness. It's the grace that God shows us is in Christ Jesus. When you see a picture of Christ, you see the Father. Jesus said, he, he, he told him, he told Philip, have I not been with you so long that you don't know God? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the express image of the grace of God. It is only by Jesus that our sins are saved. It is only through Jesus on the cross that redemption is given. It is only by Jesus on the cross that we are made righteous. That we have sanctification. That we have purity and holiness. All these things come only through Christ. And you can only access it in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that glorious? The fact that those spiritual blessings, uh, being chosen, being adopted, and having God's grace in the beloved are all ours. They're all there. They're all in Christ. Not only that, we have redemption, forgiveness of sins in Him. Keep going in Ephesians. Ephesians 1.7 says, In Him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace. Jesus says in Luke 24, 46 and 47, Thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for the Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus said, if I'm raised up from the earth, I'll draw all men to me. Forgiveness of sin is only in Christ Jesus. You go back to Old Testament prophecy. One of the greatest prophecies is in Isaiah, 30, uh, Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, uh, 5 and 6 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Of all the things that we cannot do ourselves, we cannot heal ourselves. We cannot take our sins out of our lives. It is only through the blood of Christ that our sins can be forgiven us. That was the whole purpose of Christ coming to the earth. To 
preach the gospel of the good news of the coming of the Christ. To die on the cross for the sins of all mankind. And you get to the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 and Paul says there that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The good news is the fact that Christ died and was buried and resurrected. It's the gospel. It's only in Christ we have forgiveness of sins. And that's why we look to verse, uh, verses like Acts 2.38. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Because it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we get remission of sins. It's being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ that we get remissions of sins. That is a spiritual blessing that only occurs in Christ. Only occurs in Christ. Now we've kind of made a little progression. Because Paul is not bad at this. Paul, he did a great job. And really and truly it's the Holy Spirit writing through Paul, right? So really and truly we're seeing a progression that's in the mind of God. Being expressed through Paul. And Paul says you were chosen. And because you were chosen you were adopted. And because you were adopted you now receive God's grace. And part of that grace is the fact that you have remission of sins. All these things. It, 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 it's like step, 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 step. You get down to Ephesians 1.11 and you get to the next step. It's beautiful. It says, Ephesians 1.11 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We have obtained an inheritance. In Christ. Because of Christ, we have obtained an, an inheritance that people outside of Christ do not have. We have something waiting for us. It's called the crown of glory. Uh, it, Paul, Paul likens it as to running a race. Who runs a race and doesn't run for the crown? Everybody runs a race to win. I want to win when I run a race. You want to win when you run a race. There's a crown waiting for us. And that's that inheritance that he's talking about. Peter says almost the exact same thing in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved for you in heaven. Now I want you to notice something. Peter is talking in the present tense. Peter's not talking and saying, well, you know, there, it, there, there used to be an inheritance. Or if, if it gets finished in time, there will be an inheritance. Oh, no. Peter's talking in a present tense. And that means it's continuous. Continuous. It's there waiting on us now. Now. And not only is it waiting for us now, it says there, Peter says, reserved for you in heaven. This inheritance is guarded by God. The inheritance that we are going to get in Christ is guarded by God. God is the guarantee. No greater guarantee could there be than God being there for me. It will be wonderful to see. Wonderful. So we were chosen and then adopted. We have God's grace given to us in the Beloved and because of that we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. And because of that, we know that there is an inheritance in heaven for us. That there's something waiting in heaven for us. But that's almost not all because there's still one more thing one more spiritual blessing we have in Christ. That's in Ephesians 1.13. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Did you get that? All these things that happened to us, not only that, but we were stamped with the approval of God. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. H. Leo Bowles, um, a member of the church, wrote a book called the, the, 
the work of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, his work and personality. And he's talking about this verse, and he says, you know, this means that we are anointed. The same idea between being sealed and being anointed. Identical. Being anointed means you are favored of. Being anointed means you are special for some purpose. Being anointed means you are set aside to do something particular. Being anointed means you are loved. And that's all the same things that happens to us when God gives us the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing that happens when God gives us the Spirit which is in us. That same Spirit which allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. In 2 Corinthians 1, 20 and 22 it says, For the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now He who established us with you in Christ Jesus has anointed us as God. Now God's anointed. He says God's anointed us, right? Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. A guarantee. A guarantee of what? A guarantee of the fact that you were chosen, adopted, had the grace of God shut upon you, forgiven of your sins and have an inheritance in heaven. That's what we have a guarantee of. That's the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. That's what I claim is my own. That's what I claim is my own. You know, God chooses, adopts, bestows His grace, forgives our sins, assures His inheritance, and seals us in Christ. He does all these things. Every spiritual blessing that is found is found in Christ. And yes, the only way to get into Christ is by faith and believing in Christ and doing what he requires. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. We must do the will of our Father in heaven. It's all right there for us to take. But Jesus says you must do the will of our Father in heaven. Christ requires obedience. That's just the way it is. When you go to Hebrews 5.9, we read, And having been perfected, he, because the, uh, he become, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We must obey him. That, that is what is required of us. Obedience necessitates those things which lead to salvation. Those things which we've talked about so many times. Hearing, believing, repenting of our sins, confessing the name of Christ, being baptized, rising again to walk in newness of life. All these things work together for our salvation. All these things put us in Christ where the spiritual blessings are.